Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. This is episode uh, 85, Podchat Live, episode 85, and we are talking about uh, Halix Valgus, or we've, we've gone with the word bunions because we are slaves to search engine optimization. So we're going to, we're going to, we, whether you chaps want to call them HAV or Halix Valgus from this point <coughs> forward, but it will be bunions from my mouth. So, um, Super excited to welcome two um, two consultants, two consultant surgeons. Not that this is only going to be a surgical talk, but we've got these guys in for their expertise with, with bunions. Um, firstly, old friend of the show, uh, consultant podiatric surgeon uh, Ian Riley. I'm not going to plug his YouTube channel because he's already got more subscribers than us, and that, that deeply annoys me. Um, and we're also <laughs> welcoming for the first time Mr. David Gordon, who's consultant orthopedic surgeon uh, on social media as the bunion doctor. And I will, joking aside, link to both of their sort of social media handles and channels in all of the notes below afterwards. Uh, firstly, gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, are you ready to talk bunions this evening? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thanks. And Great. Craig. And, and mm -hmm. obviously, should probably say, actually, happy International um, International Podiatry Day, um, which I'm sure you're all fully aware of before you woke up this morning and went onto Facebook when you first found out like I did. Um, but yeah. So, you know yeah what, what, a couple of weeks ago, it was, in, uh, it was National Bunion Day in the UK. Oh, we missed the window yeah, here, Craig. We yeah, missed. we just this time the podcast two we weeks late. The, um, complete coincidence that we're doing this on, on international. Before we start, Ian, before we before we start, um, we've been live for two and a half minutes. I think we've just hit a record for the most number of viewers within a couple of minutes. What have we're we got? Way Seven. We're way above our normal number of viewers, so it's obviously going to be a very popular episode. So the pressure's on, guys. What, what have we got? How, how many have we got? Uh, Sixty-five. Oh, within, right. within a minute, a couple of minutes. So that's right. that's a record, record for us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Riley that's is known for peaking within the first minute. Usually, that's his, <laughs> that's his forte. So, so um, we are going to essentially. I had a load of questions come in about bunions, and uh, and I, I I encourage all sixty-five and counting of you to to get involved in the comments ask questions of these guys. Let's be honest, none of us can afford an hour of either of their time in the real world. So we've got them for an hour tonight. So pump them full of questions. Um, you know, Craig will, will be policing the questions and he'll get them involved when the, when the timing is right. But from the questions that came in to me beforehand when we announced this episode, and it was looking like it was going to be a popular one, I, for obvious reasons, it's, it's a very common thing that most of us see. Um, there was there, I've sort of subsetted those questions and I'm going to pitch them to you guys um, sort of in those in those sections. And don't worry, we are going to get to the, the surgery and the carpentry at the, at the end. But before we do, all of the people asking questions really wanted to just get a feel for, you know, we're in these times where no one can come and sit in with you in clinic and watch how you interact with your patients. But some of the questions were very much I want to know all the questions that my patients ask me on a daily basis these guys must get asked them as well. And I want to know what they say to their patients, just to see if I'm saying the similar kind of things, the right things, or if there's any kind of cool gems I can sort of add to my um, my inventory, my, 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 my sort of uh, locker, that, you know, not that we just repeat answers to patients, of course, we're very patient-centered. But the first question, and I'll, I'll sort of pitch, pitch it to both of you, maybe I'll start with you, um, Ian. Um, the question that I'm sure we get asked every single day when the patient's in front of us and they, they present with with a clear bunion um a barn door bunion and they say by the way uh, mr riley what what actually is a bunion can you just take us through your sort of simple here's how i answer the patient when they ask me that question yeah great question and so if, effectively i would say that the the, the the bunion proper is the soft tissue swelling you get on top of an angular deformity I was actually reading something from uh, David mentioned it was Bunyan Day a couple of weeks ago. I saw I saw that actually, David, and um, apparently it comes from so an old Greek word for turnip. Apparently, it is the swelling. It comes from comes from the derivation yeah. of that. So I say yeah, it's that's... a soft tissue swelling on top of a of a deformity. Great. So you, you use the word turnip in front of your patients, just to clarify. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I yeah, do. why not? Uh, mean, I, I, yeah. Definitely don't mention any people... vegetables in my consultations, <laughs> unless they have a gardening interest. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you're essentially going down the route of saying, you know, you've got this 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 bony sort of angular deformity, and there's a soft tissue yep. swelling on top of it, and you kind yep. of kind of leave it there. Uh, David, yeah. anything to add? Anything subtly different? Um, yeah, I I go from a slightly different approach. Actually, M most patients who come and see me with a bunion know they've got a bunion or think. They know they've got a bunion and most of the time they're right i mean the one thing that is worth um and i put this slide up on a lot of presentations actually 
um, is when hallux rigidus, when you've got big osteophytes, particularly when they're dorsomedially, can mimic a bunion. So, but most of the time patients know they've got a, a, a w increased width of the foot, they've got the swelling on the side of the foot, not on the top, um, and it hurts in shoes. But, um, and often I don't need to give an explanation, but although I like to, um, I do explain what a bunion is. It's essentially um, a prominence on the medial border of the foot, on the side of the foot. But principally, it's not a growth of bone. It's a deviation of the bone from the midfoot. And it's always a surprise to patients, as well as other clinicians, actually, GPs and the like, and physiotherapists who don't quite understand. And why would they? You know, what a bunion is, how a bunion forms. So I, 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 in simplistic terms, it's a medial, it's a bump on the medial border of the foot caused by a deviation of, of the metatarsal in the midfoot. Great. Uh rifling down through our, our sort of pragmatic day-to-day -day questions. So these are questions that, that clinicians get asked by their patients, and this is the answers here are how you answer your patients. Next up, you know, uh, Mr. Riley, Mr. Gordon, what, okay, now you've explained to me what my bunion is. What, what actually caused this? And, you know, I know we all love that question. I might come to you first, Ian, just so we'd, we're back and forth. So, you know, some, a patient says yeah. to you, what's, what's, the, what's the cause of this bunion? And that, that is a question we get asked all the time. And I kind of, you know, that 25 years ago when I was kind of root biomechanics, I was all over its subtalization. It's all a bit flat footedness. So I have to fudge it now because obviously the science is out a little bit. But I will throw in a little bit of flat footedness if you don't mind. I'll talk a bit about anatomy alignments. I'll talk about footwear making them worse and hypermobility. But I, I kind of fudge it now and say it's, it's often it's very difficult to say. And for any given patient in front of me, I can never really say you have got a bunion because of X. And did I say hereditary? If not, throw that in as well. So it's a, it's a real fudgy question. I, I can never answer that very well. Mm. David? Yeah, I mean, for me, um, in terms of the pathophysiology or why you've got a bunion, it's it's that instability of that first tarsometatarsal metatarsal joint in the midfoot. Now, I don't go into that much detail with the patient about it. I just say, look, you've got an unstable joint in the mid part of your foot and it causes that bone to swing inward. The question is, why has that happened? Um, mm. And, you know, footwear always comes out. They always say, well, I never wore high heels when I was younger um, or I've always wore flats. And the answer I give is it's almost certainly not due to how you've worn or what footwear you've worn in the past. It's predominantly genetic. And if you look at the studies we've mapped out, it's an autosomal dominant with uh, partial penetration um and the family history is often I and mean, if you look at the studies about 85 percent of patients with bunions have a family history so for me i say look it's almost certainly family history related then i ask them and then often they say yes it is and i kind of leave it at that i don't go into all the other detail about pes planus or first range stability i mean it's getting quite technical and also controversial because there's no clear winner as to why you get this deformity but it's simple for patients to understand that, yeah, you got this from your mum or your grandmum or maybe even your dad, um, but we can fix it. Yeah. But, so yeah and, 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 uh, sorry, sorry uh, Griff, I'll jump in, but by and all of that, David, do. absolutely. But then, as you say, if, if it is genetic, what is it within the genetics that's making it? Is it that there's a, you know, a, a, an atavistic first ray? Is it in the mechanism that's unstable? Is it the hyperpronation? If there is such a thing, excuse me, Griff, that's causing that, and that's gen genuinely interesting to me. You know, it's I know it's not for the average patient, but it's uh, I guess this this talk is going to pods. Griff, you you're a bio guy. What do you think is the ultimate cause of of bunions, Miss Mister Bio? Yeah, I, I hate this question, which is why I wanted to know what you guys uh, said about it. I, I would ultimately always say to patients. Um, you know, I would be pretty honest and say, you know, to be honest, we don't really know. But we, what we do think is it's multifactorial. And then I will mention things like I'll, I'll normally just say to the patients, you know, there's footwear, which is a potential factor. There's genetics, which we think is a significant factor. And then there's the way your foot behaves. Um, and then I, I kind of just leave it there. I, I my understanding of the literature, and it's been a while since I've gone into the bunion specific, is it, it always comes back to that correlation with the mobility of the medial column or the first ray. Um, but yeah, it, I don't think it does, to be honest, to be fair, um, having recently reviewed the literature. Yeah, yeah we got um, <laughs> um, Yeah, it, there is so many factors um, and the majority of which are controversial because you look at pes planus or you look at first range stability. One study says it is relevant. Another study says it isn't. You look at footwear, similarly controversial, contradictory studies. So I think there's such a, a florid and, and people have been looking at this for probably near on 100 years in the scientific literature. 
and we've not really come up with some solid conclusions. Uh, so, so yeah, I, multifactorial. I mean, I tend not to go into so much detail with the patient, you know. Yeah. But to answer your question, Ian, whether um, you know what is the um, if it is a family history and autosomal dominant, what factor is that? I mean, I can only think of you know laxity at the first TMTJ or the angulation of that me medial cuneiform, perhaps. Um, mm. But I tend not to discuss that with patients. And to no. be honest, it is it's all controversial, and and, and no one's really worked out. So it sounds like a reasonable for our watching clinicians thinking I get asked this question all the time. It sounds like a pretty reasonable consensus for, or evidence based approach would be to say we don't really know, but we're pretty certain it's multifactorial. Sounds, you know, a bit, you know, it's a it's a reasonable answer. It's not an answer, but it's kind of an answer. Is that a reasonable summary, do you think? It's an honest yeah. fudge. Yeah. yeah, honest fudge. I'm, I'm all about those. It kind of brings us on to the, another question, which, again, I'm sure you guys get asked all the time um, by patients because of their their sort of psychosocial kind of thoughts about this you know not it's not necessarily uh, how painful it is that, that leads them to ask this question but they often say okay here i am here's my bunion perhaps it's when they're deciding what to do about it and we'll, we'll come on to clinical decision making for management later but what they kind of want to know is okay if you can tell me how bad this is going to get or indeed over what time period it's going to get bad then with that information i can make a decision about whether i want surgery or whether i'm going to leave it so i'm sure you get asked this question in multiple different ways but essentially when a patient says how bad is this going to get or how 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 long is it going to be before it gets really bad again it's time to get the crystal ball out in many ways but what is your what is your i guess if we don't have an answer which we probably don't what is your honest fudge to answering that question in the in the clinical setting i might come to you first uh, david yeah, it, clearly it is a, it's a common question I get asked. Um, most patients who come and see me in clinic with a symptomatic bunion um, have, have got significant symptoms that they are coming to see me to, to consider surgery. But there is a group of patients that come because they're concerned, they're getting kind of minor symptoms, you know, maybe once a week when they're doing a particular activity, but it's not a, it's not a daily, daily problem for them. And so they ask that question, you know, how bad is this going to get? I'm really worried. I don't want to end up like my my grandmother who had, you know, crossover toes and, and never had surgery and was limping around. Hmm. So um, it's a very difficult question to answer. But the way I answer it is bunions are progressive. There's no splint or exercise or insole that's going to halt its progression or reverse it. So what you have, have now is as good as it's going to get. It's going to get worse. Now, how quickly will it get worse? I normally use the analogy, it's going to be years. I don't say days or weeks. And also you can kind of look back a little bit at how quickly it's progressed in the past. So I say, well, you know, how long have you had symptoms for? Oh, well, I've had it for 10 years and it's slowly getting worse. Well, this is not evidence-based, but, the you know, I say, well, it's, it's probably going to continue in that vein. However, there does become a bit of a tipping point. It does accelerate as you get uh, more significant to bunion for some reason. I don't think that's proven, but that's anecdotally what I believe but I normally say to patients don't have surgery if you don't have symptoms now don't have surgery for what might be because we can't predict the future um because you're playing a dangerous game then doing prophylactic surgery effectively then patients come back and say well I know it's gonna you've just told me it's gonna get worse in a few years I don't want it to wait that long and then you can a bit of a difficult conversation about saying well you know do you really want surgery now for your limited symptoms my advice to you is probably wait until they're more significant. Why don't you go away, have a think about it? And often I find is patients go away, have a think about it. They come back a week later and say, I want surgery. <laughs> Actually, David, can I just throw something else in there? Um, I, I had this conversation with a patient recently and they, they were, that, were, that was the position they were in. But then they came back to me and says, but what if in a couple of years time, I don't have the health status to safely have surgery? Um, and they were weighing up that they, you know, shall I have it done, well, as you say, prophylactically, or shall I wait a few more years where I could have diabetes, I could have, you know, a more, a more risky risky medical yeah. condition. Yeah. How would you respond to that? Well, um, I get a similar, similar comment. I also get comments about insurance as well. Well, my insurance is running out. That's a warning sign for me. <laughs> Don't have <laughs> just because your insurance is running out. That's like a definite <laughs> put the brakes on. <laughs> um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, patients, you know, they're grown ups, they're adults. Um, you've got to explain the risks and benefits of surgery to them, explain and document. 
Um, and, you know, they can make their own decisions. It's up to you as a clinician, as a surgeon, to, you know, explain all of that and document it. So um, I tend not to say, no, I'm def definitely not going to do an operation because um, your symptoms aren't bad enough, because that's for the patient to say, not for me. Um, and also, they're really going to suddenly get diabetes in two years? Um, or, I mean, what's really going to change? I mean, normally you can predict health status as, as one gets older. I don't, it's unlikely suddenly they're going to have a significant comorbidity. So I would, I would caution against, you know, doing predicting something in, in a couple of years' time. I would still say, look, just hold fire. It's about your symptoms now. Do they warrant surgery? You know, come back to me. Or you say, well, yeah, your comorbidities might increase next time, but in the future, but you know, that's what we'd have to deal with at that time. And it's appropriate to wait because that might not happen. So, yeah. Just on that similar vein, we've just had a question come in on um, juvenile Helix Vulgus. Maybe we can address that more later, but just in the context of this discussion, uh, what about age and surgery? Um, question to me. <laughs> well, you know, actually, Craig, we'll come to that in oh. just a second. I just want to ask Ian, yeah. uh, okay. right, uh, just ask Riley if his crystal ball says anything different to, to David's when he gets the sort of how bad is it going to get and over what time period? And then we'll come into the, the juvenile sure. question sure. straight after. Exactly. It, it says exactly the same as, as David because, you know, we effectively, David and I will have had the same experience. I just, I'm not as articulate as David and I'm clearly not as well dressed, although I am sporting my <laughs> Dr. Mercado t shirt tonight. What I'll say to patients is, and I'll say to them, of any milk or water. Well, this is this is Romanian red wine. So I'll say to my patients, I'll say, and this is this is a phrase I use. I say, so you're married, and they'll typically say yes. I say, so you know what it's like to live with a constant nagging, <laughs> and you can live with that nagging pain, but at some point you need a voice lawyer, and that's kind of and that, that's what I say. And it, you know, the other thing I kind of build upon that is. We also see the patients that don't have a good result. And, and you know, when, when surgery goes bad, it can go really bad. So when you've had those experiences, mm. you, you find you, you, you become more cautious over time as a, as a surgeon. What's that great quote, David, about a good surgeon is, is good hands and a general reluctance to operate. So when you've been a bit gung-ho when you're in your 30s, you see those patients back in your 30s and 40s with horrendous results and you go, ha, I'll be a bit more cautious. And for that patient to say, well, what if it gets worse? Then I'll say, well, that's fine. This time it won't make any difference. It might in 20, it might limit my options. It might be I'm fusing your bunion in 20 years time when I can fix it now. But it's all about a slippery slope. And it's, David, as you said, it's for the patients to judge because they're the one that's going to go through that their subjective pain levels that we're looking to try and treat. Brilliant. Just, um, can you add in one more point there? Sure, um, yeah. But yeah, I absolutely agree with Ian. And I've, I've, I've got a, a reasonable sized um, database of, of Halix Valgus Bunyan patients, probably 500 plus, and we've done quite a bit of analysis um, on outcomes. And what's interesting is you can look at severity of the Bunyan and outcomes. Um, and actually the severity does not equal or have a correlation with uh, outcomes. You can have a minor Bunyan, have surgery and do well or badly. Same with severe, same with in between. So if a patient says, I'm worried about it getting worse, well, you can reassure them that, well, I can anyway in my data, that fine, it will get worse. Your outcome's probably going to be the same. So don't worry. Great. But just what about this question, question here? Yeah, yeah, Rosita's question's a good one. Yeah, it's, foot, it's just difficulty finding footwear, valid enough reason for surgery. <laughs> I guess we could kind yes. of we could slightly reframe that as well and say, you know, one question would be, would you ever operate on someone just because they are too wide for the footwear they want to wear? And I guess the sub question to that is how about just generally yes. operating on the 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 asymptomatic patient? So I guess we're getting into the realms of cosmetic. I, I don't correct me if it's an inappropriate thing to call it, but cosmetic bunion surgery. Is that sure. the right thing to call it? Um, could could we get your mm -hmm. your take on that? Go on, Riley. You seem like you're ready to go on this one. Yeah, so I think within our two professional groups, that and, and certainly this and the other, they're a bit sniffy about cosmetic uh, foot surgery. And, and really, I'm not. You know, a couple of my colleagues are doing quite a lot of work. And really, what's the difference between somebody who goes through elective surgery for, if you do that with informed consent and they fully take it on board, 
I don't see a problem with it. Now, that's not to say I do it. That's perhaps a little bit more London centric. But if somebody wanted purely cosmetic bunion surgery, problem with that, provide absolutely. David? Yeah, actually, Ian, we're just losing a lot of your audio at the moment. Um, okay. Um, yeah, I got I, I, running off Wi Fi. Sorry. Go on, David. David, you go ahead, Ian. Go and just sit next the to the router. Um, yeah, so I don't perform cosmetic surgery on the foot. And the, the, I would define that as um, performing surgery on a bunion purely for the appearance, uh, not for any functional benefit, not for any pain benefit. Uh, so I don't do that sort of surgery. Um, it doesn't sit comfortably with me. Uh, and, you know, for me, surgery is about risk versus benefit. So what is the benefit? And um, how highly do you rate the appearance of your foot versus the absolution of pain or the ability to wear footwear without pain so you can do your activities without pain? So that's where I'm more at on the other side. Um, but I do agree with Ian. You know, as I said before, um, patients are, are grown up um, and they can make their own decisions. I mean, what is the difference between having you know, other forms of cosmetic surgery. Um, but, you know, but, you know, when foot surgery goes wrong, it, it, can, it can be significantly problematic. Yeah. Um, so for patients who have purely a footwear problem, um, can't fit into the shoes. I mean, my normal phrase when I, or statement that I tell patients is, if you can't wear footwear that's appropriate for your lifestyle, and that can be work or activities, because it's painful to wear that kind of footwear, um, then yeah, consider surgery. So that's kind of sums up really my ethos. Um, if they can't wear foot, find footwear, normally you have to probe a little bit because if someone says, I just can't find any footwear, but I don't have any pain, um, that's probably because they found some footwear that isn't painful for them, but they're very restricted in their footwear. So if they were to wear the footwear they wanted to, they would get pain, which is slightly different. And for those groups of patients, then, yeah, it's probably appropriate. Um, so if you probe a little bit deeper and say, well, if you were to wear the footwear you want to wear, does it give you pain? The answer is probably going to be yes, in which case I'd offer them, uh, offer them surgery. Let me, think, piggy, let me piggyback. Oh, sorry. And I think, that, Go on. can I just, just quickly jump in, Griff? I think, do, do. Just, I think, and I think for the majority of our female patients, you, and I always talk about that the reasons I'd operate would be pain, um, footwear, cosmetics, and in that order. But I think for our female patients, there's, there's more of a blend. I think for a lot of the, the male patients we see, which is a smaller percentage of my caseload, it's pure bunion pain and they can, they can wear wider shoes just because they can. So I think to understand that for a female patient, cosmetic is a part of their issue and footwear fit is, is more restrictive. I think he's, 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 he's... Oops, we've just lost you. You just um, lost you then briefly I, in here. I'm oh. just going to pick up something you both mentioned, Sorry, something you nice. both mentioned um, during your answering that question. And that was that what we've essentially got here is consenting adults, which is completely valid. And we'll, we'll use that segue to loop back into Hannah's question, which was about um, juvenile HIV. So, uh, again, I not only am I, I if there's anything I'm less of than knowledgeable on surgery, it's probably paediatrics. So um, I, I don't even know how to uh, intelligently ask this question. So I'm just going to read it verbatim. Um, Hannah says, I'd like some advice on how to manage patients with asymptomatic juvenile uh, hallux valgus and associated digital deformities, useful things to tell them or reassure them. And I guess, depending on their age, useful things to tell or reassure the parent that's with them, perhaps. Um, uh, Ian, do you want to go first while, while, you're, while your internet seems like it's secure? Uh, so, or, yeah, sorry about my... Uh, no, don't off the phone tonight. Um, so I guess if they're asymptomatic, I'm probably not going to rush them to surgery because while I'm, I'm not, a, not, I don't have a problem with cosmetic surgery, I don't do it just because I don't really get those patients. So if they're asymptomatic, I'm probably going to give them some plastic fantastic and, until such time as they become symptomatic because they will. And I will say to my patients, do you know, I'd rather fix your bunion before it gets too big rather than have big bunion crossover deformity and secondary arthritis because you know, while um, you, you'll get good results with effusions, that your options are limited. Um, and obviously, you've got to think about when you've got skeletal maturity. So if you've got a, you know, a young 12 year old with still growing bones, then I'm not going to touch that foot at all. Um, and uh, before I come to David, is there a, I'll ask you this question in a minute as well, David, is there a sort of a definitive bottom line cutoff point of age where you just, regardless of the context or the 
the, the person in front of you, you just won't go there? Is it, is it that delineated or do you take it sort of uh, based on a case by case basis? Is 12 your magic number? Riley? Oh, it's the same to me. Sorry, yeah. I thought it was to David. <laughs> yeah, um, so. Sorry, sir. I was, I, no, uh, no, I don't have an age. It's skeletal maturity, growth plates. I, I don't want to be running a power saw across a growth plate. Not a good look. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, David, anything to add on juvenile, uh, Halix Vargas? Yeah, no, I agree with Ian. I, I wait, my preference is to wait till the foot's skeletally mature. It might be 16. I can't and don't operate on patients less than 16. That's um principally because within the hospital I, hospitals i work with there are new guidance um cqc guidance about uh patients under 16 and operating so i just they won't allow the, those patients to have any operations um in the hospital so um the youngest patients i have operated on is actually 16 for those reasons but skeletal maturity is the primary reason um but if they're asymptomatic which i think what the hannah's question was um then I wouldn't, I wouldn't offer surgery. It's, uh, it's reassurance, um, talk about footwear. Um, and, you know, it's no doubt if you've got a, a, an early adolescent deformity, then it's highly likely that surgery is going to be required in the near future, within the next five years, potentially, but not necessarily. I have lots of patients who come to me in their 40s and 50s. How long have you had bunions for? Ever since I can remember. What do you mean when you're a you know, teenager, adolescent? Yes. So patients can do well 30 years later. Um, so it's by no means a, for, no means a foregone conclusion. So I wouldn't ever do prophylactic surgery. Um, I would just wait till they're symptomatic. Um, and it's, it's just about the footwear. And also um, a reassurance that things can be slowly progressive. They don't necessarily suddenly get really, really bad, requiring something, you know, a year or two later. Um, but I would like, it's also worth saying that, that the juvenile or early, early onset Halix vagus, they do have a different kind of anatomy the pathophysiology is probably different in terms of perhaps that I, I do notice the articular angle of that first metatarsal is much more pointed in that vagus direction. Um, and they're more challenging in my hands to actually surgically treat as well. So I, I go with a bit more caution with those groups of patients. Um, but certainly if they're asymptomatic, wait and see. Great. So yeah, whilst it there's was... A, there's a lot of metaductus in that juvenile group. Sorry, guys. A lot of metaductus in that juvenile group, which makes um, doing a bunion fix all the more difficult. Cool. I think we've got a minor delay, so sorry if I keep it, uh, talking over you, Riley. Apologies. Um, whilst it's uh, what well, it was not our intention to get a podiatric surgeon and an orthopaedic surgeon on and to, to in, let fireworks ensue, it is, it is mildly annoying me how much you're just agreeing with each other. So I'm going to nudge nudge the discussion that towards areas where you may start to disagree, if that's okay. Um, and we're going to slowly get there. Um, and I think so, you know, the way you guys perform surgery is very different, which we will let you both uh, sort of discuss in due course. But before we get to the surgical side of things, let's talk through your, you know, we've talked about how we answer those difficult questions or those, those regular questions. You know, um, what about the, what does the clinical encounter look like for you? So could you both sort of take us through what, what a workup looks like for you? So a patient comes in to see you. It's like we say, it's it's you look at it. It's like, yep, I think I've got a bunion. Yep, you've definitely got a bunion. Talk us through, you know, your, your workup. Is it straight to radiology? Are there any clinical tests, any clinical gems that, that you could pass on to our, our, our non-surgical um, or un new, newly graduated or undergrad um, students watching? Uh, let me tell you the context for this. Someone emailed me asking me to ask this question beforehand. And they said the, the example they used is, you know, if I'm suspicious of this being a tibialis posterior uh, sort of tendon problem, I always get them to do a single leg tiptoe because I know that if that's provocative, it sort of, it shows me that that tendon is sensitive. And also if they're completely unable to do it, I'm starting thinking about levels of dysfunction. Um, is there, you know, their question was, is there a, is there a, a, a lovely like kind of clinical test that can really help me realize, okay, this is definitely a bunion and it needs X, Y, or Z. So could you just talk us through your, your clinical gems? We'll, we'll start with you, David, how you work one up clinically, um, some of the clinical tests you do, perhaps some of the, the uh, you know, further investigations you do or don't do and at what stage? Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, it's quite straightforward. So I'll see the patient and outpatients. We'll have a consultation, um, probably take about 20, 25 minutes. Um, I'll take a history, um, go through the length of their symptoms, what their actual um, problem is what they're complaining of. The site of the pain is very important. Um, I'm looking for medial eminence discomfort in footwear, um, normally not um, outside of shoes, so barefoot not normally painful on that medial eminence. 
Um, but if they're pointing to the top of the, of the foot on the dorsal aspect of the, of the big toe joint, my alarm bells might start ringing a little bit more thinking, you know, is this coexisting arthritis or is it just arthritis? Um, I'll talk about and ask about plantar pain as well. Is there any overload symptoms, particularly under the plantar metatarsal heads? Uh, and also whether the lesser toes are, uh, are affected as well. So is there a hammer toe deformity or is the hallux pushing over the second toe causing a corn in the first web space, for example? Um, so I'm kind of getting an understanding of the exact symptoms that that patient is describing of, mm -hmm. describing of. And I'm trying to think of, you know, what are we going to do in terms of non-surgical and surgical? Um, I'll go on, continue the history. Past medical history is really important. Um, particularly in, in what I do when I do the keyhole technique, um, I'd like to know the patients that have got decent bones. So their age is important. Uh, if they've got a history of osteoporosis. Um, and then we'll talk about med medication, uh, allergies, what they do for work, what they do for activities, um, and explore a little bit about, or a lot about, you know, what the footwear is causing, which footwear is causing their problems and what they've tried to do to ameliorate those symptoms, principally in wider and softer shoes. Um, then I'll go to examination. So I'll always examine the patient standing. I take clinical photographs with their consent. Um, and I'll look at the foot. So look, feel, move in orthopedics. So I'll look. Um, and normally it's, it's, it's obvious. A couple of times, as I said before, hallux rigidus uh, can catch you out. So you can get this sort of dorsomedial bump, with a slight deviation of the hallux because of the arthritis. And it's not a true bunion. But when you get to move, that hallux is going to feel there's going to be crepitus, there's going to be stiffness in the big toe joint. And then you can, once you've moved, you tend to know. Of course, you have coexisting um, arthritis with the bunion. And those groups of patients, you've got to be a little bit careful when you're doing a your surgical planning um, and consent. Um, but once you've got the radiograph, so after I've examined the patient, so I'll do a standing and then I'll lie them on the couch. I'll look at the plantar aspect, the dorsal aspect, I'll move the toe, document sensation and pulses, look at the lesser toes as well. And then they'll go off for some x-rays and they'll be standing dorsal plantar x-rays and a lateral x-ray. You can get an oblique as well. It tends not to be that useful, but at least those two weight bearing x-rays. And that's when the consultation finishes because there's a lot to do in that time. Often patients are very keen to discuss surgery, but I tend to have a perhaps an overview. Most of the patients who come and see me, they, they've done their research and they're thinking, well, yeah, I'd like to like to proceed with surgery. I'm always a bit more cautious. I, I don't like to list patients for surgery <coughs> the, same, the same day I see them. So I try and structure things in two separate consultations. Um, I might give them an overview, direct them to my website, have a read of my testimonials, watch the videos, um, but go and have a think. They come back a second consultation and that's normally a week later. We'll review the radiographs together. I'll look at, I'll look and do some planning. Um, and then I have a consent consultation if surgery is <coughs> So I spend a good 15 minutes talking to them about the risks and benefits of surgery. So it's all informed consent. Um, and then patients let me know either then or they ring my office if they want to proceed and they can organize a date for surgery. Or they say, nope, not for me. Thank you very much. And, and I'll discharge and they can come back um, <coughs> in the future. Sorry, I've got a real, a real tickle in my throat. <coughs> go on, Mike, go for it. Yeah, um, you know on, the best thing to say for that, that, that cough, Griff, pharmacological. <coughs> remember when you teaching pharmacology, the best thing to take for a cough is, is laxative. Because <laughs> you don't cough then. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, um, I, do, I do the same. My answer is the same as with, with, um, I have with 34 I have with, 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 There's no controversy here, Ian. I'm sorry. Right. I'll find okay. some. Don't worry about it. Right. I'll find some. I'm just going to say, Ian, with um, 34 minutes in, and it's taken you 34 minutes to get to a joke. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I, I know. I didn't do a single gag last time either, did I? We'll, we'll have some, we'll some stand-up oh. stand time at the end. Oh. Griff, you're struggling. <coughs> so, um, David, that was a really good DS solution. So, and again, I do the same. <coughs> so they have a primary assessment where it's basically, is it surgery, yes or no? And, and I'll get x-rays right from the go-get, but then they'll have a pre-op, pre um, his, history and physical, we, we call it, um, where we kind of do. So I'll work on NL DOCAT, which is a bit of a podiatry, and which is nature, location, duration, onset, course, aggravating factors and treatment. So I'll do that with all my patients. So it's the nature of deformity the type of pain, duration, how long? And they've often had it 20, 30 years. It was a big study was from 1953. I think it was Hardy and Clapman that said, most people get bunions in their teens and 20s, but most people come for surgery and treatments in their 30s and 40s. So it's how long they've had it, whether it came on quickly or slowly, whether it's worsening, aggravating factors, treatment to date. 
And then it's basically work it up. But David, you're probably the same as I. You've looked at somebody within two minutes and you know they're going to have a particular operation. The rest is, is, is fitting the narrative. So you've got good um, informed consent. And, and you can also, what I call CYA, cover your arse. So everything's there written down. So if there's ever a complaint about outcome or a medical legal challenge, you can say, look, here's my working out. It's a bit like O-level maths, isn't it? You've got, you got one point for the correct answer on O-level maths, but you've got nine points for doing all the working out. O levels they used to do in the olden days, Griff. Do you <laughs> remember O levels? Uh, I am well, only just. Um, so for the for the people watching, very much myself included, who don't have the experience of you guys, and certainly don't have the ability or capacity to order radiographs on that first day. Um, what what are the couple of gems that they can really look for to help them make a decision with regard to management? And I guess what we're getting on to very very shortly is. You know the conservative versus the surgical are there any barn door observations or tests or pain provocation or palpation you do uh, or is it just on visual alignment where you say right this is this, we're going conservative with this one or we're going surgical with this one i mean for me um the diagnosis is predominantly visual um but as i said the difficulty comes when if they've got coexisting arthritis in the big toe because if they've got dorsal pain um, as well as medial pain, um, we had that conversation and say, look, if you want surgery, I can narrow your foot, straighten your toe, remove the bump, make shoe fitting better for you and less painful or, or have no pain in your in footwear. However, that other pain you've got, that pain on the top of the joint will remain. So um, what I do from time to time, I offer the patient a steroid injection into the big toe joint. And I say to them, the pain that's gonna go is your arthritic pain. The remaining pain is your bunion pain. So now you know the difference between your two pains. And if we do a bunion correction, that bunion pain will go, but when the injection wears off, that arthritic pain will come back and stay with you. Now, if it's significant arthritic joint pain, coupled with a significant bunion, then you know, you've know you got a fusion if they want surgery to fix both at the same time. And the fusion of the big toe joint can correct the bunion as well as the arthritis, but you're stiffening the, stiffening the, stiffening the joint. There's no particular provocation um, for a bunion. Um, however, you can provoke an arthritic big toe with the grind test um, and also see if there's impingement in dorsiflexion. So you might want to bend the toe up in maximal dorsiflexion like they're doing a lunge and they might be impinging and cause pain in that movement. Plantar flexion of the big toe can also exacerbate pain coming from the big toe joint. So full plantar flexion, they go, ow, you're stretching that dorsal capsule over, over the, the uh, maybe a small osteophyte on the top, or it's inflamed and you're stretching the capsule and it's painful. So plantar flexion can provoke arthritis of the big toe. And then if you've got mid-range pains, you're kind of grinding and compressing axially the big toe into the joint in the mid-range rather than dorsiflexion or plantar flexion. That's again, slightly bad news indicating you've probably got mid arth arthritis in the mid part of the joint. Um, so more widespread. Yeah. Um, so that'd be more of a concern and you might want to go down the arthritic, um, you know, arthritic route for treatment rather than the bunion route. Great. Ian, anything to add? Any, any pearls? Yeah, well, really all of that. I guess the, one of the things I'd say, we'll perhaps come on to MIS in, in, in a bit, guys, but it's one of, being a bigger fan of open surgery, one of the things I'd say, Dave, is when you open things up, you know, you can really kind of see those bits. You can do little chylectomies if you've got some, some dorsal osteophytes, um, and if you've got some real articular holes, it's easy to kind of do some drilling on, the, on those holes. I kind of feel, Griff, we should answer some of um, Richard Blake's questions because he's um, he's asking lots of really good questions. So, so Richard, what's the difference between um, um, custom and prefab orthotics in terms of bunions? Uh, Richard, the, the, the prefabs are cheaper and don't work and the customs are more expensive and don't work. <laughs> okay. um I, I i know you guys i can just sense right now that we're getting to that point where you guys are desperate you're itching to talk about your sore bones and i promise you we're going to get there so let's just really quickly because i saw another question come in about uh you know we've talked conservative versus surgical well, let's just run through some of the conservative we can just maybe both of you could just give a, a thumbs up or a thumbs down whether you think it's good or whether you think it's not we've kind of touched on footwear i think that we don't really need to touch on that we've touched on injections um and we, we, we did an injection episode of this way back, didn't we, Craig, with some guy. He looked a bit like Riley, but he had less hair. I don't know what's happened in the intervening years. Um, but, um, <laughs> <Locked in. laughs> we, there's this, you know, orthoses, I think we, we all four of us agree. Well, again, a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Yeah. 
they get a waiver from me. They they get a thumbs down in my hands at least. Just, um, uh, okay. Um, let's talk about three other things. Uh, no, two two other things quickly. First was uh, bunion splints, bunion braces, bunion sleeves, whatever you want to, whatever you want to call them. Um, what what do they get a thumbs up, thumbs down? Do they have any role in conservative management? Yeah. I'm, nope. Hang on, Craig's got his thumbs up. Let's let let respond to that one. There, I, I'm aware of one study, and I can't recall all the details, but it did actually show, I think with about three months of use, there was a one-degree improvement in the angle. Um, so, you, you know, whether that's a thumbs up <laughs> or a thumbs down, whether that one degree sustains or whether you get more improvement if you wear it for three years rather than three months. But you, you've got to look at the practicalities of it and all those kinds of issues. But there definitely was an improvement of a, a degree or two. Yeah. I think but, if yeah. you draw, if you measure one x-ray 10 times, you'll get more than one degree. Yeah, I, I know, I know. Yeah, I, um, yeah I'm, I'm not too fussed about extra degrees. Extra millimetres I'll take all day long, but never extra degrees. Um, yeah. Exercises, I've got... Maybe, maybe, I've had some patient work, by the way. Uh, yeah, so just to finish on the, on the splints, I have had some patients who've had some fairly good symptomatic relief with yeah. bunion splints, certainly not angular deformity, but symptom-wise. And if, you know, if it works for them and it takes away the pain, that's absolutely cool. You just have to say, I'll see you in five years' time, you'll have a bigger bunion. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I, I've, I've seen the same. You know, I've seen a few people with, with that deep ache inside the joint. They try the bunion correctors, the bunion splints, and it does seem to help somewhat with that. But again, it doesn't make the bunion go away. <laughs> we we used to uh, with those ones. We used to we used to teach them how to kinesio tape themselves, uh, that, and we had, we got embarrassingly good results with that. And again, I, I'm no fan of that stuff. Anyway, um, <laughs> physiotherapists, we all know them, we all love them. Some of my best friends are physios. They'd kick me if I didn't mention it. Um, they believe they can pretty much rehab or exercise anyone out of any any pathology um any role for um physiotherapy uh pre-operatively uh, perhaps it's two sub questions pre-op you know exercises for bunions i'm getting a shaking head from riley and what am i getting no two shake two thumbs down post-op just for mobility and oh we got a bit of, oh we've got some disagreement let's pick at this scab a little bit where are we going with this <laughs> So, David, good, good, good. You would always post-operatively refer to a physiotherapist for mobilization and so, motion, motion is lotion. So, interestingly, I don't always refer post-operatively, but I do and have designed a post-op uh, patient-directed or self-directed rehab program. So, you can download that on my website. Um, it's very straightforward, evidence-based. I give it to all my patients post-surgery. And it goes through week by week what I want them to do to regain the big toe movements. So they might start off with just, you know, wiggling their toe up and down themselves. They might start to do seated heel raises and then single stance heel raises toward the end of the, the rehab program. So um, I'm a firm believer in mobilizing that big toe. Um, and that's the principal um, rehab that I give my patients. However, I don't refer them to physio for that. I had an interesting conversation with a bunch of physios I was lecturing to on Monday. And... Um, the general consensus from the physios, as you said here, was that, yeah, we want those patients. We can do better. We can improve their outcomes by doing post-operative physio. So, um, you know, if the patient's got the time and the inclination and, and can go to a physio in the post-op period, then I don't see there's any harm in, in, in engaging a physiotherapist. Not cool. at all. We'll link to your um, post-op page because I know there's be some people that want to see that. Riley, you... Um... Not as uh, much of a, a firm advocate of the, the post-op mobilisation. I think he's frozen on me, just as I was going to get some disagreement between you. <laughs> okay. Oh, geez, unbelievable. Okay. <laughs> oh, he's back. Oh, come on. Oh, no. Norman Collier, ringing uh, Northampton. So I missed, I missed the start of that. Go again. Okay, so a bit, bit of a physio-sceptic. Um, the majority <laughs> of patients... Am I, am I frozen again? No, no, you're good. Yeah. Okay. For some of the, the majority of patients that I have sent to physio, they get one session. A full, oh, and it says, does do this. And, and that it, it's much better if the patient's engaged and does it themselves more actively. Am I frozen still? No, you did right. freeze there. But I think I got the gist where your experience with physiotherapy was they get one session told to wiggle it and discharge that does not sound like private practice in london i promise you that riley they get no. they get um 
they, they get six to eight. Um, but yeah, no, okay, that's good. Let's get on to the real good stuff because I'm looking at the timer. We've got 15 minutes left. I hope we've left enough time for this um, because as for those people who aren't aware, these two gentlemen, I don't know the exact numbers, but they, between them, I'm guessing the, the Bunyan procedures done between you is, is comfortably in the thousands. I know, Riley, you did two before I'd even dropped the kids off at school this morning from looking at your uh, social yep. media earlier, I think. Yep. So... But the, the 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 glaring difference here is is the different approaches you use. So to, to forgive forgive my my non surgical um, vernacular, but Riley opens people up and takes a little uh, dangle inside and does his planing and carpentry in there. Uh, David is more of a, an MIS um, takes a more MIS approach, minimally invasive surgery. So I guess we should probably start because I think people will be more familiar with open stuff because I'm guessing most podiatrists have, have been through you know uh, surgical units so if, can we just start david by give, give us a bit of a summary for those who may not be aware what 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 mis is what's the kind of real short summary of, of what mis is and and ultimately uh, your your sort of um your your pitch for it as to why it may be favorable over over open i'm going to st try and start a bit of debate yeah. here between um, well minimally invasive also known as keyhole surgery is like any other keyhole procedure we're not it's it's similar to other keyhole procedures where you're not making large cuts um, in the skin, you're making very small incisions. Uh, and there are a variety of advantages that I'll come on to when you do that. And um, But you do need to use specialized instruments and learn how to use those instruments because you can't take a saw and fit a saw through a teeny weeted hole that's two millimeters. So you use uh, a burr, which is a, basically a rotating piece of metal that's two millimeters, a bit like a drill, but it cuts on the side rather than the tip. So you do the same bone cuts, or well, not the same. You you can do the same bone cuts um, as open surgery, um, and you still fix with screws. You're still correcting the deformity by cutting the bone and shifting it and fixing it with screws. Um, but you're preserving that soft tissue envelope, so you're not having to open up the joints. So uh, theoretically, you get less joint stiffness. Um, theoretically, you get less swelling, so you don't have all that soft tissue healing. Um, for me, after going over the learning curve, and there is a learning curve, it's quicker surgery. When I did do the open scarf osteotomy, um, you know, it might take me 45 minutes or maybe an hour. I can do a bunion with the wind behind me much, much quicker than that, you know, half the time easily. Um, so, you know, patients um, come out of that surgery a little bit fresher potentially um, if they have a shorter anaesthetic, if they have an anaesthetic at all, of course, they might be awake. Um, but principally, the advantages for me for keyhole are um, the power of the correction. So if you've got a really severe deformity um, where you've got a big IMA, maybe 20 degrees, um, I don't think a scarf will have the ability to correct that satisfactory. And you'll be relying, if you try and do a scarf on a big angle, you're really hooking up those soft tissues to try and get that toe straight. And you've not really restored the intermetatarsal angle appropriately because you just can't shift with a scarf, the bone that far. But with MI, because you've um, preserved those soft tissues, um, you can do a 100% translation. You have no continuity between the metatarsal head and the shaft. You can fix it with screws and the bone will remodel beautifully. We've got some fantastic pictures. Um, and so it's much more powerful in my hands anyway to do severe deformities with keyhole than you can do with um, with, 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 with a scarf osteotomy. Um, and that's 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 could i just interrupt that's super interesting because as someone who you know looking from the outside i would assume um that most people's baseline assumption would be the bigger the deformity the more likely you might have to open someone up to to to, to get on top of it whereas the you know things like you know the the smaller procedures might be might be you know more, more comfortably managed with more minimal incisions so what you're saying is that my understanding there is is incorrect yeah Okay, cool. Riley, let's bring you in because I'm sure you've got certain things to say about this. Um, what are your thoughts on what's just been said? Yeah. Your experience? So, 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 so David. So, David, when when you you know you're telling me just before we can oh, we've... do it while you were standing on the stairs, or did you do it through the letterbox? Have I frozen again? I I just got the standing on the stairs through the letterbox. What Am was I... the bit before that? <laughs> Yeah, so it's like you know, are you, are you going to paint paint the stairs through the last spot? So, <laughs> so um, I think the the advantage over open techniques of doing MIS techniques is there's less soft tissue trauma. But at the expense of a more difficult technique, I think it's more difficult to correct the deformity. So, so the the balance is trauma versus ease of technique. And actually, 
you can really aggressively correct with a scarf or a lapidus. So I think the the advantages are fairly modest, I would say. For yeah. you still got soft. So because of that, I'm skeptic. So I, I think there's one thing to remember is you've got an X-ray. Everything's performed for MI surgery with an X-ray machine in theatre. So you're not going through looking through a letterbox. You're actually looking through a big HD, you know, screen. And you can see all the bony anatomy. I don't know if you use X-ray intraoperatively, but it is a real eye opener. I mean, I never used to do a scarf with X-ray ever because it's open. Why would you need to? But with an X-ray, you really get to understand that anatomy, that three D rotation, the sesamoid correction. Um, you know where you're placing the, the the IM angle and the HVA. So um, I think you can be a lot more precise because you got X-ray. Um, and one thing I didn't mention in my previous answer was um, the recovery. So I get patients recovered very quickly with MI, um, quicker than I ever did with SCARF. Now that might be my confidence uh, and experience as I've gone on, but I certainly is fine because you've just done very small incisions. Um, you can get these, you know, I wait bear patients immediately. Um, they, you know, it's day case surgery, they go home the same day, they're walking on the first <coughs> right there's no crutches. I do get them to elevate the foot for the first week quite strictly. Um, and the second week, just take it easy at home. But if you've got a, young, a younger patient with decent quality bone, you know, they can be on an elliptical trainer uh, starting week three, doing some low impact exercise. Um, I don't do a soft tissue correction. Um, very, very rarely do I with keyholes. So I'm not worried about the soft tissues having to heal before I mobilize them. So if I've got good, strong screw fixation, I can mobilize them very quickly. And because I don't do a soft tissue correction, that's one less thing to go wrong. And mm. I see a lot of scarfs that do fail and principally, it's either under correction from a lack of good shift, which you can really achieve well with the MI, or it's due to soft tissue failure. And if I don't do soft tissue correction, <coughs> I, you know, it can't fail. Okay. I was just I was um, staying quiet so to give you your reply, Riley. Go on. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so the principal advantage really is you're doing less soft tissue trauma globally. Um, and having seen, you know, lots of the x-rays and obviously, David, I've seen some of yours, you do a really aggressive shift. But I would still contend it's inherently unstable, albeit you're putting, um, is it the BFO screw that you use? Is it the, the, is that the name of the screw? Um, no, it, I mean, I use off the it's just a big, <laughs> It's a big fuck-off screw, isn't it? So you're using a BF, two BFO <laughs> screws to really hold it. But I would still say... They're four millimetre that, screws, if that's big for you, uh, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good. Nice, nice. Good comeback. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, let's not. Let's not. So, if you, so you've got an inherently unstable osteotomy with big screws. So, I walk my scarves. You, you're bit making it stable shoulder, with screw fixation, really so it's not inherently unstable. Uh, you're, you're making it stable with the screws. It's like anything. If you screw something together, you've given it stability. Mm, okay, and I, and I guess they heal pretty well. So I think I've got um, bony stability as well as, well as, as then, uh, fixation stability. And ultimately, I think it's a different ways. I just think the advantages of MIS, as in this left soft tissue trauma, are really overplayed. Maybe if you wanted to do anterior spine surgery, doing something MIS so you don't have to open everything up, the advantage is clearer. With a bunion, I think the advantage is minimal. And you then you also lose being able to look inside the joint and say, oh, that exostosis is a little bit bigger. And uh, and I think... You do that by the... feel uh, and you do that with the x-ray. So I don't need to look inside the foot to see those two parameters. Um, so, yeah. Let me um, let me jump in. Finally, it took me 55 so, minutes so to what we need to disagree to, what, what, on can... something. Oh, go on. Sorry. So let's do a study. Let, let's let's do a, a prospective study. Let's see. You yeah, know. absolutely. Well, I'm. You know, look at a few I, there have been studies. I, just think, I think the, the advantages yeah. are relatively minimal. I think look, unless you do a randomised control trial, where you know the debate can can roll on, and and people have done comparative studies, um, and found them equally to be equivalent. I think if you've got a good scarf surgeon, a good MI surgeon, you're going to get good results. Um, I think the devil is in the detail. You know, what group of patients are you, are you looking at? But I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm presenting my um, two year results um, in the American uh, Foot and Ankle Society meeting um, in a couple of weeks. My two year data, 333 patients. And, you know, I've, I can show you that the, 
patient reported outcome measures are, are very good. Patients do really well with MI surgery. Now, I can't tell you it's better than SCARF at the moment because we need that, 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 that study. But what I can tell you in my hands, it, it, it works really well and the patients are satisfied. Sure. Can I just ask, are there any differences in return to work, return to sport between open versus minimal? Um, I don't know the granularity of the papers that have compared the two. Um, for me, um, it, it's about bone quality and uh, the patient and their compliance. So uh, what I at six weeks, I let patients do whatever they want to do. The question is, will they want to do whatever they want to do? Because they're going to be held back by the, the you know, by by the foot in one manner or another. But I have had a a, a guy do a half marathon at six weeks, um, but that's highly unusual and not recommended. Um, <laughs> big strong guy with with big strong bone, and he came to no harm, and he and he did well. Um, but uh, I tend to be reasonably, you know, more aggressive with return to activities with with the keyhole than I than I ever used to be with a with the scarf. And you, in, in fairness, David, I'm absolutely convinced you get better results with your MIS bunions than maybe some of your lower limb guy colleagues, orthopedics, who are doing hips, knees and bunions all on the same list because you are a foot specialist, are you not? Yeah, that's right. I think the days have gone, to be honest, where they would do a hip, knee and a bunion. Um, I mean, foot and ankle. Yeah, I do. Well, th yeah, there's I really... Um, <laughs> I think those surgeons who are doing the general orthopedic surgeons are, are, are very close to retirement and few and far between. Maybe in your local area, there's someone. I don't know. Maybe. maybe. Let, me, let me give the watching audience uh, just a, a question that they may be germinating on. Um, if we're in our clinics and we have gone through a similar sort of uh, clinical workup and clinical reasoning that you guys do and we've decided this is a this is a good patient for surgery and let's say I live equidistant between you know Mr Riley who does his open procedures you know 10 miles that way and Mr Gordon who does his uh, minimum MIS procedures uh, 10 miles that way what what are the the hallmarks of um, the presentation or what are the things I'm looking for to make me choose one over the other is, is that even a reasonable question to ask is there a, is there a good patient to open up and a good patient to do MIS for or is it is it purely down to the, the referring clinician and what their, their understanding is? Patient choice. So you would offer them, you would offer them, or at least you know, um, briefly discuss the two options to them and let them make a decision. Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't discuss. Well, it, it, are you talking about me as a surgeon if I'm referring, or a, no, no, I was thinking, what, what, for example. What your, yeah. What would your advice yeah, be for the I mean, referring to honest, I, I think the the, the most important. Um, influencer to decide where you're going to send a patient is um, that surgeon's experience. I don't think it's the technique necessarily. I don't think it's MI versus versus open. I think if you've done a thousand scarfs, you're going to be very, very good at them. If you've done, you know, a thousand MIs, you also should be very, very good at them. Um, and so I think it's more about that. But if you're going to send to surgeon A who does, you know, 10 bunions a year versus surgeon B who does 100, then I think you should be sending to surgeon B. I mean, that's for me pretty obvious regardless of the technique. Um, and then you've got the whole package of the experience for the patient. You've got, you know, what is the clinician like? What's the surgeon like? Um, what's their setup like? Their convenience, their locality? Well, their locality is going to be the same, but, you know, their post-operative care, um, what their reviews of the other patients are like, their past experience of the other patients. So it's more than just about the technique, I think, but principally uh, it's about volume uh, and experience. Great. Craig, looking at the time we're, we're approaching the hour we'd like to keep these things to the hour so that the podcast is nice and, and tidy is there anything coming through on the i've not got the facebook no. page open is there anything no, there's we been, need a, to there's been a couple on? of comments that that i didn't i didn't put up they were out of sequence there are a couple of questions here a little out of sequence but perhaps after this is over ian or david could perhaps go and answer some of those um this has been probably one of our more popular episodes live. I'm just watching the figures as this goes. We're, 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 we've in triple figures most of the way through of people watching, which has been really good. But I think that reflects the interest in this topic, which is... Um, Who knew? Who issue. knew, right? Sorry? <laughs> Who knew? Um, bunions. Yeah, bunions. <laughs> Yeah. Well, so look, I think it, I think we, we we do need to wind up. So, look, thanks, Ian. Thanks, Dave. That's, I think it's been really good, really informative. I, I think a lot of people have got some take homes. Um, for those of you who have joined late, come back in ten minutes. The whole video will be there. It will be up um, on YouTube uh, later today, um, my time. 
if not tomorrow the audio vision will be there as the audio version will be a podcast uh, shortly so thanks very much guys thanks gentlemen thank you